Um, so as we all know, dealing with pressure injuries can be very difficult and extremely frustrating, uh, not only physically, but emotionally. So we have um, two of our peers with us today, Jeff and Nancy, who are here just to talk about their experiences uh, navigating life with a pressure injury. So we will start off with Jeff, if you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself and kind of take us through your journey. All right. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, yes, my, as it says on the screen, my name's Jeff Solomon. Um, I've been a paraplegic since 1971. So I, I've been around the block a few times. I had uh, many, many, many pressure sores back in the 70s. And it was much different to deal with it then. You went to a hospital, you had surgery, you went to winters, you got better, you went home. I did that a lot. Um, now, fortunately, while I was there in 1976, I met my wife, so that's good. Um, but now I'm dealing with a pressure sore that came upon me. As near as I can tell, it started out as an internal abscess that I had absolutely no idea was going wrong with me. Um, until the end of October last year. Um, and, and I will admit, I mean, part of this, this session is dealing with, um, you know, how do you deal with being, um, stuck with a, with a pressure sore and how do you keep your feelings up? And I, I will admit that back in the beginning, I had a lot of difficulty in doing that. Um, I went into the hospital the first of November, and because of the location of this particular sore, I had doctors advising me that it was life-threatening. Um, and I will admit that that got me fairly depressed at the time. However, one thing that I am have always been good at is talking to people. And fortunately, I'm in a little hospital in Meaford. They've only got 15 beds. Well, the nurses are busy, they will take the time to talk. And so I talked to them primarily about my, my feelings and, and what was going on. And they didn't really have anything to say, but talking about it was what really helped me and realize that, okay, you know, I've got another bloody sore. I'm, I've got to get it better one way or the other. Um, I had been down to London to see a, a surgeon and um, at that time, she wouldn't even consider doing surgery on it because it was such a mess. Um, so I was sent back up to the Meaford Hospital. I was there till just before Christmas. And I'm now at my home, but I've been in bed since the big, first of November. So what's that, 10 months? Long time. It's the longest I've ever been down. I mean, I think the longest prior to this was nine months, and part of that was in sitting up. So, um, it it's been a it's been a journey, but I find that basically, as long as I've got my tunes and I've got something to watch when I don't want to listen to tunes, I'm good to go. And I think. Your outlook on life has, has a lot to do with it. And my outlook on life has always been extremely positive. I mean, in 1971, I'm 17 years old. The doctor tells me I'm not going to walk anymore. And I go, oh, well, okay, what do I do? Goes, well, you go to a rehab center and you get better and away you go. And I figured, well, okay, that's what I got to do. And my life changed quickly. Like probably for the better, actually, because I wasn't really going on a good path back in that, back in 1971. I was kind of a little lost. Now I'm not. And my life is good. And pressure sores, it, it's, it's difficult. What, what's most difficult for me right now is that, that my wife has to do everything. And I... I could get depressed about that, but fortunately, there are just enough nice little things in life that happen that say, no, okay, we're, we're making this work one way or the other. We're hoping that maybe by Christmas, I'll be starting to sit up a little bit in, in my chair, and that maybe by next spring, I'll be able to be out and about, but time will tell. And so anyway, at this particular point in time, that's pretty much my story. 
have you noticed Jeff sort of the like I know you and I were talking about the banana uh what was it called? <laughs> like just sort of sort of the things banana that cart. they use maybe yeah the banana cart the things that they use you know years ago as to the progression of how you know the, yeah, the vacuum was, seal and all that kind of stuff yeah, the banana cart originated at Linters to 1974 when they moved into their new building. And a banana cart, for anyone that hasn't seen one, is a, a stretcher that is set on wheelchair wheels. So you've got the, the big wheels at one end, you've got the little wheels at the other end, and you lie on your stomach with your head at the end where the big wheels are, and you wheel it around like a wheelchair, making sure that the rest of your body is covered up so you're not running around naked the time running around Lindhurst in a sheet. Um, and uh, it, it was, it was, it worked out really, really well um, because I wasn't confined then to bed. I could get up and do anything that I wanted to do. Um, I didn't need help getting back into bed uh, or getting out of bed for that matter. Um, I did it all on my own. And so I would go to Lindhurst and when bedtime came, everybody would go to bed and I'd go into the TV room and order a pizza. And it was great. I had fun. Um, I'm not having quite so much fun now because I don't have a banana cart. And even if I did, I couldn't get it out of my bedroom, I don't think. <laughs> Halls are not quite as big in my house as they are at Linters. Um, but um, while I was at Linters one time, and, and I told this to, to Tori and Julie, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story to you because I think it's, it's a story that I find inspiring. Um, and in, I thought it was in 76, it had to have been in 76, although when I was looking at the obituary for this person that said something about 74, and I'm thinking that's not quite right, but I could be wrong. It's a long time ago. Anyway, there was a young lady that, that, that had gotten hurt. She'd broken her neck. So she was a quadriplegic. She came to Lindhurst, and she was a really, really sweet, pretty young girl. And she had brought up in, uh, by the Salvation Army. Uh, so she had been very protected. Um, and because she was such a sweetheart, everybody wanted to do things for her. And I just, I, I looked at this and I, this is, this is not good. I mean, if she lets everybody do things for her, she's not never going to learn to be able to live on her own and do things for herself. So I made her basically my, my, my project for the next two months from when she, she got there until I was discharged from Linterst. I sat with her at every meal, whether she wanted me to or not. I never really asked her. I just did it. And people would come along and say, you know, can I do this for you? And I would go, no, no, that's okay. Well, we got it covered. And then I'd make her do it. And I did that for two months. I just figured, you know, she's got the ability to fend for herself. Let's make sure she does. And anyway, I got discharged from interest and away I went. Never saw Karen again. But 20 years later, I went back to Linters to have a bone scan. And I thought, well, I'm there. I'm going to get into the physio area and see if there's anybody that I might know. And oddly enough, there was. And he came out and he says, oh, Solomon, you old son of a gun. You know, how are you doing? And at any rate, we just greeted and said, oh, I got to get back to work. And I said, okay. So now there was a woman sitting on the couch in the in the lounge area. And she stood up and she said, are you Jeff Solomon? I went, yeah. She said, do you remember Karen? I went, oh, gosh, of course I remember Karen. I love Karen. She was great. I had a lot of fun with Karen. Okay. Said, well, you know, she. I use the bathroom. I want to have a shower. Jesus. She talks about you all the time. And I went, wow. And she went on to have a very successful career. I think she died in 2019 or something like that. Um, but I mean, she she lived for a quadriplegic. She had a really good, full life. And Apparently, I had something to do with it. So that has really sort of inspired me. So anyway. we talked about, Sorry, yeah. Jeff, I was just going to say you and I had talked about that, that you never really know the effect that you can have on someone, right? And even with these kind of peer connections that we're doing now, we can all learn 
from each other. So that's why we had, like I'd said at the beginning, and, and I still, if anyone wants to share any experiences with pressure injuries or, you know, what you do to stay positive as well, like we welcome you to share because again, we all learn from each other and, you know, what somebody says can make a big impact in your life or, oh, I heard, you know, just say this, I'm going to try it. Wow. It really worked or. Well, and please do, if you've got anything to, to say, because I mean, I've been in bed for 10 months and so far I've kept things pretty positive, but you never know. So if you've got some tricks up your sleeve to keep positive, I'd love to hear them. Or if anyone has any questions for Jeff as well. I know Jeff, again, another thing we talked about is you had mentioned that you do stay in bed um, most or all the time, right? And I think I had mentioned that I heard a doctor. Constantly, yeah. Yeah, that I had heard a doctor on one of the calls say, um, that they sometimes now recommend so that people get up, kind of get up for part of the time, and then go back to bed and get up. And I think from what the doctor was saying is because they're realizing that pressure injuries can have such an effect on your mental health, which is huge as well. So, you know, to be able to get up and, and kind of live your life, even if it is for small portions throughout the day that they find that that can help. But you had mentioned for yourself, if you just want to explain why you you decided well yeah um and i've talked to my to my nurse unfortunately i've got two exceptionally good nurses that come in to see me one one every, I, they come in once a day um and yeah there are some some thought about getting up when i back in the 70s and 80s when i was dealing with other sores the idea of getting up was just you just didn't do it and um this particular sore was exceptionally big. I've never had a sore this big. And it was suggested to me at a time that I needed to stay in bed. And I went down to see the surgeon in March again. And uh, this time she agreed that surgery was a good idea. And, and she sort of mapped out where previous um, incisions had been made and said okay we, we can do this um, but I don't know when it'll be it'll be sometime in the next few months well the sometime in the next few months just never came I kept waiting I kept waiting and if, if I'd had surgery back in March I'd probably be up in a boat by now but it didn't happen and by July when I think they might have been ready to do surgery it was healed to a point where I think if a surgeon looked at it, they'd probably say, well, no, we don't want to do surgery now. So I, I, I tough it out. And fortunately, my disposition doesn't, it doesn't allow me to get depressed. Um, I get concerned, as I say, from my wife. But the fact that I've stayed in bed, and I'm on a, this very wonderful air mattress, so it's why I'm able to sit up right now to do this meeting. Um, you know, it's just the reason it's healing so well is because I'm staying off it. Um, um, when I was young, um, the idea of using a transfer board was foreign to me. I just paraplegic don't use transfer boards here only for quads. Yeah. But now I'm old and fat transfer boards to prepare us too. And, um, just the idea of, of dragging my butt with this sore that's healing nicely across the transfer board just doesn't seem like a really wise thing to do and i need this to heal so i wait and hopefully i don't have to wait for another year but time will tell and i think everybody knows their bodies and knows what's right for them and stuff so um Okay, if I think it's no important question. to know your mind too, Julie. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I fortunately I know what I'm like, and I I know what I need, and I, I'm I'm really fortunate that I don't need much. Uh, I need my wife to look after my basic needs, which she does admirably and really really well, and she only complains once in a while. Tell them I'm in the room. She's in the room, so I can't say much about her right now. <laughs> But, um, 
you know, fortunately, I, I've, I've got an exceptionally positive outlook. And I just simply don't let things bother me. Um, if I don't sleep, I don't sleep. Well, okay. I'll get sleep the next night. And you just, you, you need to try and figure out in your own mind how you can keep positive, what you need to do. Um, and, you know, for me, it happened to be Lego. I have built a lot of things out of Lego since I've been stuck here in bed. Nice. Um, including a very large model of Hogwarts. That took me a month. So, eh, just keep your fingers busy. Listen yeah. to music. And I read a lot. And sorry, Lego is something new that you just started well, I, getting I, into? I, I had built, no, over the years, I had built a few um, Lego models. Um, my wife had sort of, she bought me the um, architecture kit and buildings that were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I was initially in my early years of, of working, I was a, a draftsman for an architectural firm. And so I was, a, I'm a very big fan of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so I built a few of his buildings, um, but they don't have any more of his buildings. So I've moved on to other things. I wouldn't have thought of doing it, but my wife but thought, well, you know, you seem to have a better outlook when you're building things with your hands. Mm -hmm. So Lego it became. Nice. I mean, with technology, I don't know. It obviously depends if people are into technology or not, too. But that's another nice thing, you know, that keeps getting better and better for, you know, different things. If you are stuck in bed, you know, there's lots to do on your phone now or your tablets mm -hmm. or all these streaming services. You can watch whatever, whenever. And Yeah, well, my wife and I watch cycling. We, uh, okay. we, we thoroughly enjoy cycling and, uh, you know, that can take, depending on what race it is, anywhere from two and a half to six hours. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the six hours is a little like watching paint dry, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's still, it's yeah. fun. Yes. Yeah, keeps, like keeps, like. keeps out of trouble. Nice. And I watch a lot um, of, I watch quite a few movies. Yeah. Again, it's the nice thing with all these streaming services. It's just kind of right mm -hmm. at your fingertips. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, Nancy, did you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experiences? Okay. Um, so, hi, guys. Um, right. So, I had a pressure sore maybe like um, twice before. And when I was um, a patient at Lenhurst 20 years ago, um, we didn't have and then patient educations or peer support sessions like this. So I didn't attend um, any of the uh, educational sections and had no um, previous um, knowledge about precious or until I actually received one. Uh, so um, this is very important for people who are still inpatients at Lyndhurst uh, to be aware that this is a very common um, condition. And once you get one, for me, it took about a year to finally heal. And when the first one healed, um, the skin was no longer the same as before. So uh, at the very same area, um, I had a, another one. So uh, this is a condition that can really make your healing journey um, regress. Uh, I have prepared a little presentation. I just want to uh, share some basic um information on um, prevention or wound healing. And, and this is from, um, the reference is from a book called uh, Eat Well, Live Well with Spinal Injury and Other Neurological Conditions. And it's authored by Joanne Smith and Kaylee James. So Joanne Smith is also somebody who has a spinal injury and Kaylee is a nurse. Um, so this is some, what I, the highlights on the chapter on process or and nutrition. Um, I just want to share what I learned. Okay. Just give me one second to make this full screen. Mm. Yeah, okay. that's good. good. All right. So, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn off my camera. I just, um, so yeah, it's estimated that 
um, the chance of developing a, a pressure sore following a spinal cord injury is 85% to 95%. So that is very high, the likelihood. And um, also, once you had a pressure sore, your skin is only 80% of its original strength. So you are more likely to get another one in the same area. And also, the risk of getting a pressure sore increases 10 to 15 years post-injury. Um, therefore, although you uh, might not feel like this is something we're having to you now, but because of complications following spinal cord injury, um, it's very likely that you will have it down the road. So um, prevention is very important. And there are a couple of things to help you um, learn about the reasons behind a pressure sore and in order for you to prevent it. Um, first one is outer circulation. So after a spinal cord injury, especially the levels below injury, we have a compromised circulation. Therefore, oxygen and um, essential nutrients are hard to get to that part of the body and tissue. Therefore, um, that is a factor. And also altered um, collagen production. We all know that collagen is something, a building block for skin and tissues. So below the, uh, the level of injury, those productions are also um, less efficient um and also um um sorry and amenia <laughs> sorry i don't i don't know how to pronounce it anyway um anyway this is when um the number of red blood cells or concentrations are low and this is very common among people um especially after spinal cord injury for for me i also have this condition um, so it says that for people who have pressures for following, following a spinal cord injury, 70% 70, 70 of the patients have this condition. And also atrophy. So uh, when, our when our muscles has atrophy, it makes the parts very bony, especially our sibilant area. So I can literally feel like my sibilant is very prominent. And so when we have um, a very pointed sibilant that is very likely to cause a pressure sore in your bum area. Um, body weight, uh, this is, if you're overweight, then you can put a lot of pressure when you sit. So your bum would receive a lot of pressure. That is not ideal. But on the other hand, if you are underweight, um, your, your body can be very thin and also you can lose a lot of those paddings. So overweight and underweight are not are both not ideal not ideal and also changes in body position and sitting this is like when you sit um it will increase like depending on how you sit so it's very important for you to go to a sitting clinics and to do um a proper fitting for your wheelchair because if you, you don't sit properly then you are more likely to put more pressure on certain area on your bum and that area is likely to develop a pressure sore uh excessive moist moisture oh sorry. Uh, excessive moisture. This is important um, when you have a bowel treatment or a bladder treatment that you really um dry up your bottom properly because if it's too um there's too much moisture there that can make the skin break down easily. I like imagine if you're in a swimming pool for too long, your hands are, you know, there, there's little uh, wrinkles. So if, if there's too much moisture there, your skin will likely to break down. Uh, there's other factors. Um, heat is another factor. Um, this is true when we sit in our wheelchairs, especially sometimes our cushions are not very uh, air circulated. Then when we sit, our bottom area, we receive a lot of um, uh increase uh, skin temperature and that is another factor for pressure sore and also if um, the heat is too much um, it would be a breeding ground for bacteria to develop so if we have a wound and the, and if there is too hot then we can have bacteria infection as a result um, and after spinal cord injury we also tend to have um, dysfunctional immune system. So, cause that has to do with our circular uh, compromised blood circulation. So with a compromised immune system, it help, it makes it harder to fight an infection after a um, pressure sore. 
Loss of sensation and movement. Um, if we have normal sensation, we won't sit for too long. We feel discomfortable, even feel painful, and we would you not know, walk around. But because we don't have proper sensation, we are le less likely to do um, pressure relief. So this is very important if you can maybe time yourself, maybe every 15 minutes to 20 minutes, try to uh, lift up from your wheelchair to do a little shifting. Uh, malnutrition is another factor. If we always eat junk food or food that have too much sugar, um, then that will cause our body to break down more. Spasms and spasms can cause pressure sores on certain part of our body, um, such as knees or ankles, because they uh, those additional frictions may cause pressure sores, skins to break down. And lastly, lastly, thinning thinning skin. This happens um, in people who are more aged. Uh, when their skin is thin, then it's likely to break down. Um, so this book also give us some tips on um, how to eat properly to um, make the pressure so heal faster or sometimes even prevent pressure so from forming because um, what we eat is like uh, building blocks. Um, if we don't eat properly, then we don't have those materials to, to build a building, right? So uh, what we eat um, is very important. Um, first of all, if you already have a pressure sore and during a, a healing process, your body requires extra calorie. So the ideal suggest suggested amount is 30 to 35 calories per kilogram of body weight a day. Um, but when we say increased calorie, it actually means we have to eat um, food that doesn't make us gain weight, but at the same time um, helps, I guess, have like a better like, better nutrition but doesn't necessarily mean that we 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 have to be fat right so we have to consume healthy food such as nuts avocados whole grain breads whole grain pasta pastas brown rice so things that is healthy for uh, the body but not necessarily make us gain weight um they also help eliminate toxin um and then we have the increased protein. Protein comes from fish, dairy, um, beef and chicken, greens, beans, nuts, and protein powders. So protein it will really help um, uh, makes our skin, you know, uh, more smooth and um, makes the skin um, heal faster. And also eat fats that hide uh, sorry, eat food that's high in vitamin A, C, D, E, and zinc. So those are all very helpful um, as part of our um, how to eat properly. So I, I'm actually very, very inspired to do a maybe a quick video on this topic. I think uh, with um, more like visuals and graphics, maybe people can have a better impression. Um, okay, and then drink four, cup, four cups of water and fluid each day. Mm, that's very important. And then take amino acid. Um, and then eat good fats such as like walnuts, salmon, um, sardines, tuna, halibut, um, yeah, flex, flexi seeds, omega-3 fatty acid. So those are what we should be aiming for. And lastly, just take skin healing nutrients and herbs. Um, yeah, coenzymes. So yes, so I think this is something that there's a lot of uh, wonderful information in this book uh, about healing. And I think we can do a nice um, uh, conclusion, but sorry, a nice summary in, a, in the Kotri TV video. So please watch out, um, subscribe to our channel. <laughs> All right, anyway, so my conclusion is that um, having a... a, a a pressure out, uh, out, um, pressure sore is common, and but it's totally preventable if we know all the factors behind it. And when when and when when we eat healthy, when we have better nutrition, we totally prevent it, and it's not something that has to happen. Anyway, that's my presentation. Thanks, Nancy. There's just a couple things in the the chat box I wanted to. Um, read. So Ron, I don't know if you were 
saying that you do remember the ba the banana cart at at Lindhurst. Yeah. Yeah, I saw. I had never heard of it before. Oh, I, I yes. It's very interesting. Yeah, I saw people were using that before, but during my um during my experience, I was still able to sit up um during certain like I was still able to do my like my I guess I just had to lie down more often often, but I was still able to go out. Um, I um I was using a phone cushion before. I I think that was the main reason why I had a pressure sore. But then I changed to a rojo cushion, and I was told that with this cushion I was still able to uh you know go to school or the I can the activities was not totally affected. Um, yeah. Um, but it did take a long time for it to, to be completely healed. I have to change my dressing carefully. I have nurses coming over twice a week to change the dressings. I have to make sure that you know it's 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 bound it's uh it's wrapped up properly uh, in order for me to um still go on with my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Important obviously to stay in touch with your doctor to make sure, you know, for you what the right treatment is and that kind of thing. So another comment um, from Ron. So thank you, Ron, for saying this. this is another thing that we should mention is it's good. He says it's good to volunteer. Mentoring new spinal cord injury clients helps to realize how lucky we. So I don't know if you got cut off there, but um, we, you know, I'm not sure if you all know about spinal cord injury Ontario and what we do, but um, a, a portion of what we do is called the peer um, is the peer program, and we connect individuals. Um, with others. So if you are new to having a pressure injury and you want to talk to somebody and connect with somebody that's had one and that can kind of do this and let you know what their experience has been like, we are more than happy to make connections for you. Um, you just have to give us a call and we can connect you to the right coordinator for that. Mm -hmm. um, because again, it's all about information sharing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next one Ron had mentioned is, and I'm not sure, um, Ron, I don't know if you want to explain. So you had mentioned gel cushions, or air cushions helps also uh, sheepskin. Mm. So that's to sit on with your chair, I'm assuming you mean? Mm. I don't think anyone can see you, Ron. Ron's showing his his seat cushion. Oh. I, if so, you wanna show okay. again, I just spotlighted. Okay, Ron, do you mind showing that again? Oh. Is this okay. a gel one? Ron, you are unmuted. If you were talking, we can't hear you. Oh, oh yeah, 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 I think, yeah. yeah. There's uh, all yeah. sorts of seat cushions out there. You just have to, I think, talk to your doctor and your vendor and an OT to find out which one works. Yeah, works one of my, you. sorry, one of my practices are also to, to to not always sit in my wheelchair um like i transfer onto a floor mat um you know i lie on my stomach and also i transfer onto my couch so just not always sitting on the same surface all, the whole day try to mm -hmm. um change your position more often um mm -hmm. i have this like big exercise mat on the floor and i can just i can also type i can also work on the floor by lying on my belly uh, I, I found that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, someone for me, so I'm in a power chair. I've got a C4-5 spinal cord injury, so I can't transfer by myself. So I rely a lot on my the tilt feature on my chair. So I'm constantly kind of, even if it's just little bits at a time, um, changing my position that way with the, the tilt. Ron, I see that you unmuted. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to mention I got up, uh, I used the gel in the house. I'm just experimenting which one is better. And the robo cushion, when I take off in my scooter, it's a little thicker, a little more comfort when you run over the bumps and stuff. Yeah. And there's a local company that sells sheepskin here in town that you could put to help uh, um, for moisture and that kind of thing to help prevent it if you can. I'm fortunate I've never had that problem. Uh, but just wanted to mention, I've been seeing a gentleman at, at the rehab hospital in town here, and he did have a, a an injury with his spinal cord, but while he was in the hospital, they didn't turn him enough, and he developed a sore on his backside, 
and a sore on both his ankles. So I just, the reason I'm saying that is don't think just because you're in a hospital, you still have to be careful of your, um, of your injury and what problems it can involve, which is why mentoring sometimes helps so much, in my opinion. Anyway, thanks no, for your sure. sentence. Yeah, no, I agree. And when you're newly injured, you don't always know what it is that you're supposed to look for, right? Or what you are supposed to do. So if you can get that experience from somebody else, it's it's amazing. And yeah, the every turning two hours or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Does anyone else have any experiences they want to share or maybe any tips and tricks? Okay, well, we've in got terms two. of practical. We'll to... Go ahead, Christine. Yeah tricks um i'm just that i got a gel cushion like that for my my toilet and i found that i had a vac for a while on my wound i've had a wound for oh, getting close to three years actually <laughs> and um i it the hose for the vac would catch on those the hard plastic between the between the air so that didn't work very well for me. So it's, you have to be really careful about um, equipment. And yeah, it's very individual. But in terms of mental health, I, um, I've, I don't know, it's a mixed blessing. I've gotten interested in some advocacy because here in Ottawa, and I think throughout Ontario, I don't think they, the treatment for pressure wounds is very, it's fine to be concerned about our individual behavior, but the system is, you know, really inadequate to deal with these or to deal with prevention. And like, I had a problem with my shoulders, which was caused by weight gain. And that's what led to my pressure injury. If, if there was any focus on, I, I never had a physiatrist really talk to me about weight gain and what to do about it. I ended up seeing a doctor that specialized in weight and she was great. And if they should have somebody like that part-time at our rehab center here so that they can, you know, we can stay on top of weight because weight has all kinds of implications, huge for pressure injuries, but also for diabetes and other conditions, right? And it really robs our independence. And it's so common because of lack of burning energy and there's, you know, there's no emphasis on that and shoulder health. Like there's no free exercise classes at the rehab, but those would cost a portion of what it costs to treat the average pressure wound. You know, I'm saying to the nurses, you'd send nursing forever because you have to, but to put that money into prevention. So anyway, with my background, I've done some advocacy, uh, health advocacy before, and I'm just getting interested in advocating about these services and coordinating more the treatment of wounds and it helps my mental health in a way to think okay i can make it better for other people but it's it's kind of negative in a way it's kind of depressing because i just i'm getting more into the problems you know that exist and facing the barriers of yeah well we don't have money to do that or yes we all know that we should have this coordinated wound clinic but we can't put that in you know there's it'll take years to put that in place and so it's really frustrating but I think I have skills in that regard and I'm trying to work on that even just basic information about shoulder health maintaining your shoulders and telling young people that weight and shoulders are really important like newly injured people I mean and say you know just you may be able to do this with your shoulders now, but be really careful to maintain your shoulder health because, you know, that's such a direct line between the shoulders and pressure injuries, at least for paras. Because um, I was heaving myself here and there and getting in and out of the car. And then, you know, I hurt this shoulder and I started doing bad transfers and that's what led to the wound. And three years later, I'm still laid up with it. So it's, you know, it's really important. And yeah, I knew vaguely that shoulders were important, but not, you know, like, and peers too, because if a peer tells me something, it means a lot more than having a, a 
you know, a professional tell me somehow that, yeah. yeah, I used to be like you and think, oh, I've been able to get by for 20 years. Like I didn't have a pressure wound for 30 years. And then um, I, you know, now this one is really bad. And I had to have a, a pick line antibiotics for a while. And it, it was, I didn't take it that seriously at first because I'd never had one. And then it, you know, it just got worse. And I was so, I still am having problem with depression around, you know, it's not just, you know, getting this healed, but it is the fact that from now on, I'll have to be so much more careful. And I got a lift, a ceiling track lift now, so I don't have to do manual transfers, but how can I travel anywhere? Like, I just don't know what my future holds. And I just feel like, yeah, everybody's happy that, oh, it's getting better. And it's, you know, it's a lot better than it was. And, you know, oh, you should be happy. But I'm like, well, yeah, but I, <laughs> I had a friend who had one heel. And then, you know, within a month, she had another one open up in the same area. So, you know, I'm not scot free is what I'm saying. So it's just like, people don't understand what that's like to think, okay, from now on, like, I'm going to be really compromised in what I can do mm -hmm. for the rest, you know, of my life, basically, like, it's hard to think about that it's like oh you should be so happy that it's closing but it's like yeah how can I'll I travel stay in, stay in hotel beds or on an airplane even you know like how can I fly for hours go anywhere do anything if I even go visit my sister in Toronto you know like her bed you know I'll be able to sleep on a bed because I have an air you know circulating air mattress at home now and it's just like thinking of all those implications is difficult. Mm -hmm. A lot more to think about. And we all know, you know, they can happen so quickly, but yet they do take so long to to heal. Um, I just wanted to mention sort of as you were talking about your shoulder and stuff, and I completely agree when you're hearing from peers. So I don't, I'm not sure if anyone's been on our poetry website, but we actually have an aging with a disability series. Um, and that's part of one of the things that they talk about is the, you know, the, the shoulder pain, you don't think about it when you're young, as with many things, right? I mean, you're a teenager, or you're young, you can do whatever, and you're invincible, but you don't think of the future where you need your shoulders, especially if you're transferring, you know, in, until when you're older and stuff. So you you do. And, and again, our peer connections, you know, we've always got peers that are willing to to chat to newly injured people about this kind of stuff, whether or not they they take it or they hear it from someone and, you know, still go on doing the, the sports or whatnot, but at least we've got that available. Um, Jeff, you had a question or a comment. You're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, when Ron was talking about the, um, the uh, sheepskin, and a, one important thing to note is if you're using a rojo, don't put sheepskin on it. Um, it defeats the purpose of the rojo. Um, so that was it. Gel cushions must be a lot better than they were back in my early days because I used to gel cushion for a while and I, it was awful. That looks like a whole lot better cushion you've got than I had. So I'm not sure if Ron was going to respond or not. No. Um, Ron had also just put a, a thing in the chat about he's been following aging with spinal cord injury, very informative on our, our core tree um, channel. Um, is there any other experiences anyone wants to share? Any questions for anyone? Oh, so Jess Breach just put our core tree. Thank you um the link to get into our core tree channel in the chat feature as well so we've got that um managing pressure injuries yeah there's a whole bunch of different videos on our uh, coretree.com website if you ever want to check it out um we've got our youtube channel as well that we put the link in so you can go and check out any of those videos um and like i said we're if you want to put any um 
future topics in the chat box as well. We're happy to to take those and um, do presentations on different topics. We like to do what we can and whatever somebody wants to learn more about, we'd love to, to help that. So if there's no other questions or anything, I just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you so much, I'll Jess. Just, can I just say, so I guess yeah. SCIO, I mean, to me, the advocacy about services is key and SCIO doesn't go there, right? Like there's no. We do have an ad, an advocacy program. Have you ever been in touch with Peter? Does no. that name sound familiar? Okay, if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to email you his email address, or if you want to go on to our website um, under public policies, it has all the things that, that we are working on. Is that something you'd be interested in? Yeah, yeah. So I know, okay. uh, I guess you're doing the P for free campaign, which has basically no chance of going getting that getting passed unfortunately oh, especially so. with this government but we're trying we really are trying um tori just put in thank you tori um a link in the chat box as well as understanding some of the um issues again that i think that's the link tori that that will outline all of the campaigns that we've got going on yeah okay and christine i'd be happy to share peter's email with you if you think it would be something you want to get connected with or on our website as well. I think there is, um, I don't know, Tori, if you correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is a place where you can sign up under the advocacy portion and you will get an email back um, from, I don't know if it would be Peter himself, but in how you could possibly get involved. Okay. So should I put my email address in the chat or? So I will send you, I'll send you the link. So yeah, you don't worry about put anything. I'll I'll send you the link through to your email um, where you can sign up for the um, joining the advocacy program. So I will I will send that to your. I've got your email, so I will send that to you. Okay. And then um, Joan, you wanted to share a coping strategy. Yes, please. Yes, just to give you. Um... A little bit about my own situation. I've been paraplegic for 48 years now, and I'm 72 at this point in my life. Um, I never had any pressure injuries until recently um, due to an abscess, as Mr. L Solomon had experienced as well. And now I have been in bed for, well, since last late November, hmm. alternating from my back to my side. And, um, but I am getting up four half days a week. And one of the ways that really helps with my mental health, and I, I certainly agree that uh, giving back to other people really helps to take you out of yourself and lift your mood. I was an occupational therapist for 23 years as a paraplegic. And um, it, it, that just was absolutely marvelous. But now, um, after having retired, I have found that um, getting out into nature, particularly for me in the woods, on the lakes, I mean, really anything in nature. And I live in Toronto. And one of the things I did was join the Toronto Field Naturalists. And I worked with them to, um, and a, a membership is very inexpensive. I think it's still $30 for a year. And they offer 140 lectures and uh, walks per year. And in their, I worked with them in their job, in their, in their um, walk descriptions to include the information that you would need to know whether or not it's something you could manage, like what the surface of the ground is, whether or not there are stairs, whether or not there are handrails on the stairs, um, features like that so that you can determine in advance whether or not it's something you think you could manage. So if anybody else likes to be out in nature and finds that really helpful for their mental health, I highly recommend it. And um, I highly recommend uh, joining Toronto Field Naturalists to, to get into uh, all the vast number of ravines in the city of Toronto. Toronto is built on rivers and creeks, all kinds of waterways. So that's my 
recommendation. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Tori, you had mentioned you have a strategy. Um, I work for a spinal cord injury in Ontario. I've met some of you before. I do have chronic pain. I have had for the last six years from a neck injury in a car accident more than 20 years ago. And this summer, I um, had a flare up between pain, anxiety, and insomnia. And it was very bad for a couple of months. And one of the strategies that helped me a lot that might or might not be useful was having a designated worry period in the day. So something that gets away from me is like, kind of like what Christine was talking about, you know, what if I can't stay at with my sisters? What if I can't travel? What And like, I just run on those what ifs into infinity. And uh, so I would give myself like 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening and I would write them down. And then that was it. And it took me a long time. It took like six weeks before I had any actual discipline on that. But it it helped to write them out. And then after that, I would do a little gratitude list. Um, and some days it would take me a while to, to think of any, like a bad day where I'd been really full of negative thoughts. It would take me a long time to get there, but it really would shift my mood when I could get out of my head and my fear about not being able to sleep or fear about a pain flare up and, and think about, you know, even just looking out my window or my kids or um, a good meal or a good book or whatever. It was like, it was something I really clung to when it was bad and I was hardly getting any sleep. And so, I mean, I don't like journaling, but it was a really useful strategy. And I've seen it referred to in other places. So if you haven't tried, that could be worth a shot. Thanks, Tori. I do find I hear um, like on TikTok or whatever, I see videos of people, you know, if you do have anxiety or that kind of talking about just those little steps. And I feel like you just, you have to keep going with it, right? And like you said, it's not really that easy maybe to do it at the beginning, but like, wow, what a difference can it make if you continue to do it? So I like that. Thank you. Is it okay if I add just two things, Julie? Yeah, please. Um, so based off the worry time that you, uh, Tori mentioned, uh, it reminded me of a uh, cognitive behavior therapy portal. That is, I'm reading this off of an email uh, that was it, that is available for individuals with spinal cord injury. Um, it's free. It's a CBT pro uh, online uh, program. Um, it's something that I did. It is available to those that ha uh, that have a spinal cord injury, um, and that worry time is something that you learn in that in in those eight to ten weeks. Um, so when Tori mentioned that, um, it reminded me of that. So Julie, I can send that to you if you'd like, um, and if anyone is interested, please reach out to us, and we can we can send that to you. Um, because it, if you're a person with a spinal cord injury, uh, it it's your uh, it's you should be eligible for it. Um, and then the other thing was just uh, to Christine. Um, I'm, I've had a spinal, I, I have a spinal cord injury. Um, it's at the C8 level, but I had a pressure sore in 2020 that I had to have flap surgery for. Um, so all of the, everything that we were talking about mental health, um, I experienced that, went through a very low period of mental health. Um, I feel like my mental health might still have be affected from all of that, but you mentioned how you're worried about all the things that you'll now be able to, or you might not be able to do, but I was just like, you have a spinal cord injury. You are, you know, you've gone through a lot. There's a lot that you have had to work through with that. And so all of that is sort of what I've, I don't know, I applied a life after a pressure injury. Like it's just, I've, I've had to do research before because of my SDI. Now I might have to just do some extra research because of my pressure injury. It is harder. It does take a little bit, of, not a little, it can take toll on your mental health because now you're just, I don't know, there's an extra thing you have to worry about, but we've all done it. We've all gone through like all these very difficult things. And I think like 
you'll be able to do it after you've had your pressure sore healed. And you also mentioned peers. Um, even if you're not a person with a new spinal cord injury, you can still self-refer yourself to the peer program at SCIO if you feel like you might benefit from speaking to someone else, another peer. So keep that in mind, even if you are, you know, 5'10", I'm 19 years into my journey, like it has been helpful for me at SCIO to talk to other people like Julie and all of our other coordinators. So you can still do that, you know, 10, 15, 40 years into your, into your spinal cord injury. Those were my thoughts. Thank you. And thank you for saying that, Jess Bree, because I think a lot of the times I said newly injured, but yes, absolutely not the case. You can, it doesn't matter how long you've had your spinal cord injury for, we can connect you with peers. Yeah, Christine, what are you going to say? Yeah, just thanks. And yeah, I am actually connected with a, a peer again. Good. Through our local branch. Yeah, thanks. Nice. Good. Yeah, and I just, oh, go ahead, Jeff. I'm mute this time. I just wondered if uh, Tori and Jasper could send in an email the various links that were in the chat. Yes, that would be. I can combine, compile all of them and send them to you, Julie, or however okay. we do that. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. This has been, sure. this has been wonderful, by the way. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone. I mean, it's, you know, it's not always fun talking about this stuff and maybe, you know, we're vulnerable when we're talking about this kind of thing, but it's all about sharing. And again, this is how we learn. And I love these peer connections for that. So I thank you all for sharing your experiences and even just coming and listening and hopefully you've learned. And again, we've got our, our peer program. We've got lots of good videos on our core tree, on our YouTube pages. Um, that you can take a look at. So contact us, contact your, you know, whatever your local spinal cord injury coordinator is, or even if you're not sure, um, just contact our main line and they can get you connected um, with the right person. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeff, Nancy, for sharing. Um, everybody else, I just want to thank our um, sponsors. So our provincial partner, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and Hollister Inc., our provincial bowel and bladder, as well as vehicle modification sponsors, um, as well as our regional sponsors, which is Lor Learners Lawyers and Mackenzie Lake Lawyers. Um, our next peer connection is on October the 19th from 530 to 6:30 on relationships and intimacy. So if you're interested in checking that out, just go ahead to our website and register and maybe we'll see you there. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a nice evening.